It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. It gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Coming to you on a Monday, November 18th. A little special quick uh, episode here for you as the LA Galaxy get prepared for an expansion draft. Make an announcement about a designated player. And, uh, of course, look at rebuilding this roster. And I don't like the term rebuild, but we're going to use that. Rebuilding this roster uh, through these different drafts and through this offseason in 2020. Should be an interesting week. I don't know if it'll be a busy week. Uh, but it's an interesting week for the LA Galaxy getting through the expansion draft and starting to move towards these other drafts as they get closer. All right, in order to help me do that, he's not in studio this time, but that's okay. We're uh, we're still glad to have him. It's the Panda himself. How's it going, Kevin? Guess what? The MLS All-Star Game is coming to Southern California. That's what I heard. I heard not only is the All-Star Game coming to Southern California, uh, but that it's against uh, Liga MX. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, by the way, this is the second time it's in Southern California. In 2003, it was out at the, what was then the Home Depot Center. Right. Um, and Galaxy hosted that one. And that was the only other time it involved the Mexican team. Uh, the MLS All-Stars beat Chivas of Guadalajara 3-1. to one. Um, Since then, and, you know, and then in 2005, they started this series of games against European, touring European giants. Um, uh, in 2017, they had a great TV audience for a game at Soldier Field with Real Madrid, mm-hmm. which at that time was the Champions League defending cha- or the reigning def- uh, Champions League titleist. Um, but in recent years, you've seen the, uh, last year or in 2019, it was the lowest um, TV rating ever for an MLS All Star game. And I think MLS looked around and said, "We've got to do something to arrest that." And and they did look also at. The fact that on uh, on Spanish language TV, the game did very, very well. It uh, was the third highest ranked ever on Spanish language TV and the lowest ranked on uh, uh, English language TV. So I think the pairing with the Mexican League is probably a good one. And this will be a me- – my understanding is this will be a Mexican League all-star team. It will right. not be a, a you know, Club America or Chivas Guadalajara. It will be a Mexican all-star team that will come play the MLS all-stars. It's interesting, and, and you look now at the – the ties between Liga MX and MLS, we have CONCACAF Champions League, which, you know, has been around forever. Then recently in the last two years, we started the the, the Campiones Cup of the, the two league champions meeting. Uh, that's a one game uh, tournament. Then we have the uh, the League's Cup, which the Galaxy played in last year at 18 tournament, t- tournament what, with three rounds, I believe. Um, it, that started up between the two leagues. And now we have this agreement to work on the uh, MLS Liga MX All-Star game and in eight years you know uh seven years look ahead it's going to be mexico the u.s and canada all working together on the world cup right. so there are some real ties to coming together between these two leagues and i think it just benefits everybody well yeah yeah i mean you have the strong viewership from from uh from the mexican viewers who by the way you know everybody points out the most watched league um you know between mls and liga mx in the united states is, is, is liga mx we we know that um, we've seen the numbers. So, I mean, you're trying to sort of, you know, focus that and try to convert some of those, I think. Uh, it was all sort of laid out in a plan. I don't know um, I don't know if our, our listeners have read it or not, but there was an athletic article that basically got to look at what the Boston Consulting Groups um, did a secret study for Major League Soccer that has now been released, and there's a whole bunch of things in there that have happened and that could possibly happen. And one of the things was really to maximize this partnership between Liga MX and MLS. And so this sort of follows that get way and so uh the game at bank of california stadium liga mx um all stars versus uh versus the mls all stars so i don't know i think it's gonna be interesting um i think it'll be uh be a lot of fun and i think that you know if you're looking for viewership and tv ratings i mean quite honestly that makes me want to watch it a lot more than the mls all stars playing some european team right now yeah, it does. But the other thing is, I, I mean, I think everyone can agree the level of play in the Liga MX right now is is fairly superior to MLS. It's getting closer, but I think the Mexicans still uh, are pretty safely in control. So if there are a lot of blowouts, I mean, if, if Mexico wins the first four or five or six of these, I think there's going to be a time where people are going to go, let's move on. Let's play the Samoan All-Stars or let's play Fiji or something. Um, but if they can keep it competitive, um, it's going to be interesting. I mean, uh, I think everybody would love to see Carlos Bella and and Jonathan Dos Santos play against Mexican players. 
I mean, here's, here's two guys, right, that I think Carlos may have played briefly in Mexico. Maybe not. Maybe he started in Europe. But certainly Jonathan's never played in Mexico. And Jonathan might be playing against his brother Giovanni if he makes the, if, if he comes back from his gruesome injury and is able to make the Mexican All-Star team. That would be great. Well, well the thing is, you know, we talk about the gap in the, in the two leagues, and there is a gap, I think, whenever you're looking at club levels. There's definitely a gap. But if you're going to tell me that MLS can put together an All-Star team that will be, let's face it, the majority of them, you know, uh, players from outside of the United States. There's, there's. Uh, whenever you look at MLS All Stars, usually it's slanted towards the international players. Uh, so you're going to put together a, a team of international players versus a team of international players. Which again, in Mexico, you have international players, you have Mexican players, you have all that sort of thing. I think that the playing ground or, or the playing level should be fairly close. And you tie into the fact that you know the MLS All Stars will get no time to play together, and the Liga MX All Stars will get no time to play together. So they're equally unsure of how they're supposed to play each other. I think that might work just fine. Yeah, well, we'll talk about this a little bit as we go on, but when you mention international all-stars at MLS, you know, with Zlatan uh, leaving last week or, or announcing that he's leaving last week, following Wayne Rooney and Bastian Schweinsteiger out the door, this leaves MLS without a big-name European star uh, for the first time since David Beckham signed in, in 2007. And and the, the whole idea that this is a retirement league for aging European stars I mean, I think that the evidence showed that that was not true for a long time. But but now that era is definitely over. Um, we definitely closed the door on that. The league is becoming, uh, you know, even before they went into Mexico for the All-Star game, the league is becoming very heavily uh, influenced by Latin American players, young Latin American players, some from Mexico, most from South America. The Galaxy, definitely part of that trend yep. with the number of Latin Americans and South Americans that they brought in. And I talked to Bruce Arena recently, and he expects the Galaxy to continue to uh, uh, develop into an Argentine, an Argentinian team. And we've seen that already with the coach and, and Christian Pavone, who now the Galaxy have picked up his option, so he'll be back. Uh, but there's a lot of young, exciting South American players. Uh, you know, Raul Rudy Diaz. We got uh, Javier Martinez. Uh, uh, you know, Pity Martinez. A lot of these young Latin American players, Diego Diego Rossi, Brian. You know, uh, just it, on and on and on. Uh, Eddie Segura. Um, and, and that's where the league is going. And, and Bruce Arena thought that was a good thing for the league because. It also helps capture the Hispanic market, but you have to kind of, we're going to talk about this too, big name players in LA. You kind of have to look past the names. You have to say, I've never heard of this guy, but boy, he really is good. As opposed to saying, I want to come out and see Steven Gerrard play on one leg and try to limp around for 60 minutes. I mean, now we're going to see some soccer players. You might not have heard of them. Nobody really heard of, of, uh, of uh, you know, Al Marone before he came to, uh, Atlanta United. Now he's playing in, in the Premier League. Yeah, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I, let's start with uh, with expansion draft, just because it talks about protected, unprotected, and then that's going to lead us into Christian Pavone signing uh, or not signing, but basically the Galaxy extending his loan, which we always figured was going to happen. But um, there's some nuances around that, and, and also how it goes. Um, so, By the way, why is this? A sh you mentioned at the top that this is going to be a shortened show. Why is this going to be a shortened show? Because I have I have dad things to do. My wife is already like, hey, uh, you're not recording tonight. Night, right and I'm like eh, we're gonna throw a show together real quick and then I and then she gave me the sigh and she's like you know it's not it, I was told it's not it's not LA Galaxy season right now it's baby season so well, how um, long are you gonna milk this 18 years unintended tw 25 years thing yeah 25 just, years I, I don't know I think I've earned it I think I have some capital built up so you know I'll, I'll, I'll milk it as long as I can um, I did order some some LA Galaxy onesies just because you know I, I feel like if the kid is going to have a team, it's going to be the one that's closest to him. So uh, clearly an LA Galaxy fan in the making whenever he's born. Oh, um, well, there there goes my there goes my baby gift for you. I guess I have to get you an LAFC <laughs> kit now. We'll we'll see how that works. We'll see how that works for you. <laughs> anyway, so um so no d you know I have to do that. So let's get to let's get to some of this stuff just because it's there's not a lot of news, but there's some interesting little tidbits that you can string together, and I think we can we can shed a little light on what is going to be happening here um, just quickly down the road as, as we're starting to put everything together. Um, but with the expansion draft, the LA Galaxy came out and announced their protected slash unprotected list. Really, they announced the unprotected um, and then we go ahead and, th and throw the converse of that and make it a, a protected list. But the LA Galaxy announces announced their unprotected list for the November 19th MLS expansion draft, alright? This draft happening uh, basically the day after we're recording so you can look for the results for that. I'll tell you right now, uh, Kevin and we're I... Be wrong on everything we said. No, no, we're not going to be. I don't think we're. I don't okay. think the LA Galaxy are going to have a player picked. 
Um, I really don't see that there's a whole bunch of value. And for the most part, we are just looking at Miami picking LA Galaxy players because it seems that Nashville and the LA Galaxy have a handshake agreement with the Dave Romney trade that they would not select anybody in the expansion draft. So really, you're looking at the at five picks from Miami. And is Miami going to waste one of their five picks on some of these unprotected? So let's go over the unprotected list real quick, and then you and I can talk about it. Uh, Fabio Alvarez, Uriel Antuna, Servando Carrasco, Emil Cuello, T- uh, Tomas Hilliard Arce, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Perry Kitchen, Matt Lampson, Joel Pedro, Juninho, Chris Pontius, Jorgen Shelvik, and Didi Traore. I would like to point out that our projected, the COG, it was my list, my, uh, my COG protected list, um, basically differed from this in only one player, and that was Didi Traore. I protected him on my mock expansion draft protected list, and the LA Galaxy chose to protect uh, uh, Justin Vom Stieg. Um, so Vom Stieg was protected instead of Didi Traore. I don't think that in just in that one move and the difference between those two, I don't think there's much difference in those. And basically because they're on reserve roster spots for both of them, um, Miami would have to come in and offer a senior roster spot. You're going to do that for a starter. You're not going to do that for a guy who you're not sure is a starter uh, because it matters about minimums and how much they get paid and how which roster spots they occupy. So it's a big risk, I think, for Miami to do that. But Kevin, we can, we can talk about all that. But looking at this unprotected list, um, some people may be scratching their heads on some of these. And so let's go over these real quick and just sort of be like, yeah, this is why the galaxy protected them and then understand yeah, well, or, or, or didn't protect these guys. Yeah. I mean, we could throw some of these guys out right away. It's a lot of times going back to Europe. We know that already. Right. Uh, Chris Pontius not only announced his retirement last week, but today announced that he's taking a job uh, with the Wasserman sports agency. So he's already got a new job. He's not going to play soccer. We know yeah. job, job Pedro's not coming back to Correct. MLS. Jurgen Selvik was paid a million dollars last year. The galaxy have already let him go. Yep. I don't think anyone's picking him up. Nope. Um, um, I, I have on fairly good authority, Not it's not been done yet. I don't think Servando's necessarily made up his mind, but uh, Servando Carrasco is very unlikely to play next year. His wife, Alex Morgan, is about to have a baby. Sounds similar? Yep. Sound familiar? Exactly. But about to have a baby, and, and he and I talked during the season about the you know the, the couple's desire to start a family and the idea that Servando playing soccer at a minimum wage while his wife is in Orlando and he's in L.A., it just didn't make sense, and he thought he might be more useful – uh, retiring and becoming a Mr. Mom. And so uh, I think that's what's going to happen. And then the top two guys in the list, Fabio Alvarez, the Galaxy are not going to pick up his option. Yeah. So he's going back to Argentina. And Uriel Antuna has drawn a lot of interest now, I understand, from Portugal, but also Chivas in Liga MX. Apparently, he's on loan from Man City. Um, Man City has said that they will give the Galaxy, this is from Dennis DeClosa, that they will give the Galaxy the uh, option of first refusal, in other words, a chance to match whatever any other team offers for him. Um, it, it, the rumors are that Chivas has offered $11 million. I right. don't think that's anywhere near true. When, when I printed or, or tweeted out the list of unprotected players with Uriel Antun on, I immediately got an email from Hercules Gomez, the former national team player who works for ESPN and played for a long time in the Mexican league. And his, his, what he said is that means he's gone. If the galaxy didn't protect him, he's gone. But why would Chivas pay 11 million for him? And my response was they won't, I don't think they'll pay 11 million. If they know they're bidding against the galaxy, all they got to do is figure out what the galaxy might offer. I think the galaxy would be foolish to go more than four or five on Antuna. So they can't, I don't even, they can't even do that. I mean, you look at what they would be willing to pay in order for a transfer to come in. And that has to be factored into his compensation. The LA galaxy don't have a designated player spot right now. And we'll talk about that. Don't have a designated player spot open. Then they're not going to give it to Uriel and Tuna. No, they're not going to give it to him. And so why would Chivas offer 11 million? I think Chivas probably offers about half that and they still get the player they want. Yeah. I I would say right now that from all indications I've gotten is that Uriel, Uriel, Uriel Antuna, including because he's not protected on this list and other reasons, is not coming back to the LA Galaxy. As a matter of fact, on our rumor tracker, and you can check our off-season rumor tracker, we put that basically up to four stars. Uh, four out of five stars that that's going to happen. Now, I don't know if it's to Chivas or basically, I've always said this, if it's to somewhere, if it, it's he's going somewhere and more than likely, I think Dennis um, and Guillermo have already counted him out from coming back to the LA Galaxy. If for some reason that all falls through and they can get him on another loan, then Kev, I mean, they would do that again, I think, in a heartbeat, but they're, I don't think they're going to uh, look at purchasing Uriel and Tuna. Um, so that makes sense. Like you said, Fabio loan hey, ended. Hey, yeah. 
I was going to say one thing, if you're wondering, well, if the Galaxy won't pay this, why would Chivas win the Galaxy probably need a player like him? Well, Chivas will pay a little bit more because Antuna now is a Mexican national team star with the year that he had. He is a big name in Mexico, a much bigger name in Mexico than he is in Southern California. And Chivas benefits from having a Mexican national team star on its team, um, just as the Galaxy benefit from having Sebastian Legette. You may look at Sebastian and say, hey, he's not the greatest star in the league, but he has that cachet of being a national team player, and that is to the Galaxy's benefit. I think the same works in Mexico with a young, uh, dynamic player like Antuna and his uh, national team pedigree going for a, a you know birth in the World Cup team, I think is probably worth an extra you know few hundred thousand to a million dollars for Chivas, and it's not worth that for the Galaxy. It'll be interesting. If Manche- Man- Manchester City doesn't see the value in selling him either, he could come back to the LA Galaxy on loan. Um, which, again, if you're looking at a gamble, see, this is the problem with expansion teams. You're not looking to take a gamble on any of these things. It doesn't pay off. If you're Miami, you want five starters or five close to starters or, you know, four starters and one bench guy that you're going to get out of, you know, pulling these or a couple bench guys. You need some solid players to put in there. And Uriel Antuna takes up an international spot. Um, He's on loan, so nobody's going to pick him up right now. That's not the way that that's going to work, and nobody's going to pick up his rights. We talk about Zlatan, which is funny. People are like, well, why is Zlatan even on this list? Well, technically, Miami could go and and pick up Zlatan Ibrahimovic's rights. And if he ever decided to come back to Major League Soccer, he would have to play for Miami, except he wouldn't because he'd be like, I will go wherever I want to go. Um, so, you know, that's that's why these things are a little weird. The, the one I think that people talked about, we talked about Didi Trari, that was one. Um, the other one is Perry Kitchen, and we know the Galaxy are, are we're looking Looking to offload his contract at some point um, in this offseason. I don't know if it continues to be that way, but it seems like that was that way. At four hundred and almost four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars on a salary, he's an expensive player if he's not going to be playing. Um, and if the Galaxy are trying to move him because he's still under contract, it looks like, um, you know, this is one of the reasons that they unprotected him. Could Miami pick up somebody like Perry Kitchen? He might be one of those players where you sit there and go, if you have extra allocation money like Miami is given, you can pay a slightly overinflated fee in terms of paying Perry Kitchen 475000 And if you get some extra allocation money in there because your expansion side you can sort of make that make a little more sense again I don't see uh, Miami gets five picks Nashville SC gets five picks so 10 players total will be could be because they don't even have to take them all could be selected um, from all of the teams that remain in uh, in Major League Soccer outside of uh, a couple that you know don't don't get to get picked from or whatever yeah. To, to talk to your strategy of they want to pick five starters, uh, that, you know, the, the last expansion draft that we're kind of intimately familiar with in Southern California would be the, the 2017, which is when LAFC picked its players. Who did they take? Number one, they took Tyler Miller, became their starting goalkeeper for two years. They took Latif Blessing, uh, midfielder, started how many games? More than 50 games in the last two seasons. They took Marco Urunia, who was a big cog in their first season until yep. he got injured. And, and and now is no longer with the team, but he was certainly more than serviceable. He was a big star. Yep. And then they took two lesser players who they traded to Montreal for Laurent Simon, who yep. was their captain in their first game. So you're right. You don't pick guys based on uh, you know, future. I, I thought Didi Traore was the most attractive name on that list, but you're right. No one's going to take him because he's not a Miller blessing Urania type player. Yeah, you don't know. I mean, and I think even whenever they picked up Miller, they thought perhaps he was going to be a backup, right? But he ended up being right. their starting goalkeeper. I mean, you could pick a backup goalkeeper. You know, Matt Lampson. Maybe he's a guy you pick up in the expansion draft. Although he but might. He's thirty. He he is, and so. But I mean, goalkeeper thirty is like you know normal people twenty five. So that's not that's not ridiculous. Um, Who are you as old as? You're as old as someone. I'm as old as Zlatan. And like I said, How's that working out for you? as accomplished, I imagine. I mean, does Zlatan have 711 podcasts? I don't think so. He has almost 711 goals. No, he doesn't. He's way short of that. That was going to be my okay. one thing I could ever hold over his head. Um, no, but, you know, you, you look at that and, and you say that. I mean, that could be one. Again, it just, to, to me, I'm not sitting here going, oh, wow, the Galaxy really had to stretch to protect some guys that they, that they are, you know, they had to leave some guys unprotected that they really wanted. They didn't. They basically got to offload everybody that they didn't want, which means your protected list right now is Jonathan Dos Santos, Ramon Alessandrini, which is interesting. We'll talk about that. Christian Pavone, which is interesting. We'll talk about that. Um, um, you know, Diego Polenta, that one is super interesting as well. Uh, People Gonzalez is protected. Joe Corona is protected. David Bingham, Sebastian Legette, 
Um, let's see. Rolf Felcher is protected. I love all the people who told me they weren't going to protect Felcher. You guys are out of your mind. Um, Dan Stairs is protected. Uh, Julian Araujo is protected. And Justin Vom Stieg is protected. Those are your 12 that are protected. Um, they didn't, uh, you know, you can't unload all your international players, but you look at that and you say, okay, that's kind of the core that the Galaxy are building around. Now let's go to, um, there weren't any surprises in the protected list, right, Kevin? I mean, n none of this shocked anybody. No, I do think it's interesting though, that Polenta was protected. And, and, uh, I think it's encouraging for Galaxy fans that Alessandrini was protected because yeah. if they felt like he was done and there was no way to work anything out, I understand they're offering him a very, um, um, low contract offer he may have to take as much as a uh, 50 pay cut if he wants to come back but the fact that he's on the protected list means at least someone in the front office thinks that he's in their future and that's good for galaxy fans because i think he's a really good player yeah he, he very well yeah and that could be a, a good thing so yeah you look at roman alessandrini it's interesting because right now as it sits um and technically not even this is just in a time frame and i, I need to be clear about the time frame right now christian pavone uh just announced today that he uh that the loan was extended from boca juniors we all expected this and that he will be a designated player for the 2020 roster all right we so expected that too yeah, yeah, we none of that was a surprise. Um, we've known that basically since he signed his original deal, and why this is a why he wasn't a designated player this year, this half year, versus why he is a designated player for next year, it has, simply has to do with the loan fee. Um, I don't think his salary is going to change dramatically. Uh, he's making one point two million dollars on an annualized basis, so you can divide that in half basically. Although he played eleven games, not really half the season. However, you want to do that, but um, basically one point two million dollars on an annual basis. We'll see if that jumps. In the second year, maybe it doubles and you know it ends up being three million dollars or or however that goes. But he is going to be a designated player. Um, and the reason he wasn't was the one point two million dollars was uh, was low enough to be bought down by Tam, and there was no loan fee for this first half. This is where everybody calls the LA Galaxy cheaters. I just think they're really good negotiators, especially Dennis Tocosa getting Boca to be like, yeah, just give them to us for free for the first half. And they did. Um, now the LA Galaxy have exercised the option on Christian Pavone, the, the second loan option, which means they do have to pay a fee to Boca Juniors. Again, we don't know how much that is, but it is enough that that plus his salary is going to take it over the uh, $1.5 million in TAM, and basically now he becomes a designated player. And he occupies the spot that was vacated by Zlatan Ibrahimovic. So if you look at it and you said that you were going to bring everybody back, Jonathan Dos Santos, Roman Alessandrini, and Christian Pavone, the LA Galaxy currently have all three designated player spots taken from. But what we know is that the LA Galaxy are trying to negotiate a deal with Roman Alessandrini. As shown on the protected list, they protected him. We know that there's there have been some talks and some negotiations and whether or not he's coming back. And the most likely outcome to this scenario, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, is that they get Roman Alessandrini for a targeted allocation money uh, fee, and that's how uh, the LA Galaxy then have another open DP spot to fill uh, coming into the 2020 season. Yeah, I, th I don't think they fill all those DP spots. They've been burned by that before. Uh, I don't think they're going to do that again. I think Dennis is too smart uh, to do that. I, I do think the Pavone uh, transfer fee, when we see it, is going to be really inflated. And the reason I think that is I think they probably said to, to Boca, look, we'll make it up to you. You know, don't charge us this first year. Help us out of this jam. We really need this guy. But we'll make it up to you on the, on the back end. And they did that with Zalatan, too. Remember, when he signed the first year, um, uh, it was, what, a million and a half? Right. Which, I mean, that's for, Zalatan loses that in his, his sofa cushions each night in change. Uh, so they came back, and, and for the second year, they made him the highest paid player in league history. Um, they made it up to him. And that's what I think is probably going to happen with Boca. I think when we see this transfer fee, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be pretty high. But, you know, the other thing with Ramon is, um, uh, you know, he missed most of the season, was injured, had injury problems. He was injured a couple of times. One that, that, that the operation that kept him out for a long time. And he's getting older. I think he'll be 33 next season. So he, it, given his it re reduced uh, availability, his reduced production, the fact that he's getting older, I still think he's worth signing. I still think he's a valuable player. And I think he's the kind of player that the team needs. I don't think you think of him as a 34 game starter and I think you price him accordingly. So yeah, if I'm the galaxy, I definitely do not leave a, a uh, designated player spot. I, I do not use it on him, but we also know that the player is extremely motivated to come back to Southern California. So if you can get him for, uh, you know, last say a million, um, I think that's a really good deal. And I think Ramon would do it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Ramon, 30 years old. Interesting. 30, no, yeah. He's older than that. No, they have on the MLS website 43 1989. 
Well, uh, that must have been a leap year. So I got to add like he, an extra year for every four years. He just, he, you know what? Quite honestly, he plays older. He plays older. He's he injured. He, he's injured. It's it's difficult. Although when he plays, he plays like he's never been injured in his life, and that like you know he can run forever. The dude will run himself into a wall. But no, I mean I I get what you mean. He, he feels that. But I was looking at that today, and I'm like, he's only thirty, but he's had a lot of injuries in that thirty uh thirty years in yeah. order to to get him to where he's at now. But he's an old soul too. <laughs> his play is very mature. But when you look at Roman's situation, he's not going back to France. Um, you know, he kind of you know burned his bridge when he left there. He had a very poor exit with Marseille. He's not going back to France. He's probably not going to play in one of the top five European leagues. So where does that leave him? You know, places where he could make money, t- uh, Turkey, China, somewhere in the Middle East, maybe in Eastern Europe. I don't think so. I don't think Roman wants to go there. I yeah. He really likes Southern California. He was one of the first guys here to have bought a place. He bought a condo. He spent his first full off season here. His wife is learning English or girlfriend, I guess, wife. I don't know what they are, but his his partner is learning English. Um, everything it seems to indicate that he wants to set down roots here, and he's not going to go to. I don't think he's going to go to Turkey for an extra two hundred thousand dollars. I think if he gets a million or close to a million, he's going to stay here, and I think the Galaxy know that, and they're going to negotiate accordingly. Yeah, you know what would make uh, Roman Alessandrini even more palatable to the LA Galaxy is that not only if they could get his salary down to what I think is, you know, I think if he makes Jorgen Shelvick money, by the way, I'm not disappointed in that. Uh, no, he's a lot more productive than Jurgen Shelvick right now. He, I, I think that's true. And so uh, if you could give him a million dollars and let's say, you know, a guy like Ramon Alessandrini, who's been in the United States now for a little while, could get a green card uh, yeah. and not take up an international slot. Because I need to remind everybody real quick, uh, the L.A. Galaxy have eight international slots as of right now for the 2020 season. They had, I think, 11 um, this year. They bought three extras in order to get them to where they're going. Um, so they have eight to start with, and they can buy some more if they can find some more um, in order to complete that roster. But as we're starting right now, you're looking at eight, um, and those eight can be only be filled by eight internationals unless you you buy more. So any international player that gets a green card that doesn't necessarily take up an international slot anymore, another guy who would be prime uh, real estate for that, Jonathan Dos Santos. Uh, has now been in the United States for a little while. So if he could get a green card, you could look at possibly reducing the number of international uh, players that the LA Galaxy rely on or replacing those internationals of players with other internationals um, in order to sort of fill out the roster. So I think the, the manipulation of the green card as well as the salary for Ramon Alessandrini would make him really palatable to the LA Galaxy in 2020. And I think they need somebody like him. If you figure that they're giving up um, Uriel and Tuna, um, and you know that sort of he was a starter. Uriel Antuna was a starter for the LA Galaxy. They're losing that starter. Um, you know, unless something drastic happens where Manchester City decides not to sell him and the Galaxy can get Antuna back on loan, um, then you're you're losing that starter. So you need to now have Pavone on one side and who's going to be the other side. Roman Alessandrini really could be the best answer for that, um, which I think is interesting. So in the Christian Pavone deal, LA Galaxy now have to make some really it, it sort of I think it puts a little more pressure on this Roman Alessandrini deal to get done and be done with that and sort of move on. So the Galaxy one can continue shopping for designated players, which it seems like uh, they were at least uh, up to a certain point looking uh, over at uh, uh, per- Paris Saint-Germain and uh, and Edison Cavani. Um, so I know that that, that that seems like they were interested there. I don't know if the money's going to work out for them um, on that deal. But if they were looking at that, um, one of the things they have to do is get the Roman Allison Dream deal sort of done or send him on his way. Well, that's why I think they keep that, that designated player spot open for as long as possible because, um, well, first of all, we don't know what's going to happen with the CBA. They might wind up with four DPs. That was one thing that was talked about. I don't no, think it has a lot of traction. No, that's, that's not happening. Everybody who's – I think that's like you know pipe dream wishful thinking for people. That's not something that the that the MLS Players Union wants, and I don't think it's something the owners are necessarily jumping up and down about either. But, but they, they're going to keep that spot open. I don't think they're going to get Cavani. Apparently, he's asking for a lot more money. I checked in with a, a, a source I have at PSG, um, and usually when you ask those kind of questions, like, you know, is one of your best players coming to MLS, they, they laugh and sort of put it down. His response was, well, he is out of contract at the end of the season, which is kind of a way of saying we really don't want him. Um, so, uh, But he appears to be asking way too much. And, you know, with the exception of a guy like Zlatan, who – clearly had something to prove after the knee surgery or Bastian Schweinsteiger who 
uh, at, was at Manchester United as well. You know, the, that's the funny thing is the three guys that just left all had ties to Manchester United mm -hmm. and Rooney, Schweinsteiger, and, and Zlatan. But, you know, Bastian Schweinsteiger wasn't playing. Th those guys were motivated to come here and $7 million for Zlatan and, and, you know, Bastian made about half that. That was good money for those guys. I, I think Cavani still thinks that he is a, uh, you know, a double-digit million-dollar player. Right. And so he's not ready... Another guy that's come up, though, in conversations is uh, Luis Suarez yep. at Barcelona. And there's already been talk internally. Messi and, and Suarez have both been linked to, to statements saying that it's time for Barcelona to find a replacement for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's crazy, though. I mean, whenever you think that you could possibly, that, that Barcelona could lose two of those guys in the next, you know, three years. Um, I, I think that the time frame for that is is pretty short. I, I think it's interesting. Um, I, you know, there's there's a part of me that says maybe Roman Alessandrini, you know, keeps the designated player spot through the first half of the season because the Galaxy are going to want to focus more on a summer transfer whenever the world market opens up a little bit more. Um, and so that could possibly be a thing that that still happens. But I mean, you're focusing on you know players who can still play. C Cavani apparently asking for uh, we saw in in rumors today, uh, fifteen million dollars a year. So is he twice the player that Zlatan Ibrahimovic is? More than twice the player that Zlatan Ibrahimovic is? He can score a lot of goals, um, but he does he certainly doesn't bring the off field as much as Zlatan did as well. Um, you know, and then then PSG apparently asking for twenty five million dollar transfer fee. I think the Galaxy are like were, uh, would be happier more with like free transfer I think that's what they're looking for free transfer um, whenever you're looking at spending money um, and then you know I I don't think that it's too long before we see a team in MLS and particularly the LA Galaxy spend 15 to 20 million dollars a year on a player um, I don't know if it's that if this is that season and I don't know if Cavani is that player I tend to believe no that the answer is that's that's a ridiculous number for Cavani but those numbers also seem to indicate to me that agents and clubs are throwing out numbers right now and that usually means that there might actually be some um, negotiations going on or at least some feelers being uh, felt out uh, that numbers coming out that are way above what I think everybody would think would be market value at least coming into MLS um, are now out there right now. Well, let me throw another name at you because this is a guy that I, I I'm going to continue to make this uh, proposal, and at one point, at some point, it's going to be good. Uh, it's going to be true. I've, I've been making it for years now. I think that uh, Chicharito Hernandez would be a really good fit for the Galaxy. I think they could. It, he needs to track back on defense, which is something that that Suarez doesn't do either. Um, you know, they would have to somehow motivate these guys to do that. But this is a guy whose time with the national team in Mexico is over. Apparently he hasn't been called in for a while. So the idea that he needs to continue to play against high level European competition in order to stay fit for the national team, that's gone. Uh, he's not playing a lot at Sevilla right now. Um, uh, you know, he, we know that his current market value according to transfer market is 12 million. So that, that means he could be had for less than that. Um, when he went on the transfer to Sevilla from West Ham, the transfer fee was about $7 million. So if you can get that down to half of that, you know, it, the, the numbers all work out. And, and again, he's not playing a lot for Sevilla. He started to play a little bit more recently, but he's not one of their, their, their top flight guys. I, you know, we know he's coming to MLS at some point. He has to just the marketing potential alone for a good looking Mexican guy who speaks English and Spanish coming to a market like LA it's just too perfect, and I think he's going to wind up – he's on the wrong side of 30. I think he's going to wind up here eventually. Why not now? The Galaxy could use him. Um, you know, that would be a guy that, to me, it makes even more sense than Suarez or even Cavani. Yeah, I, I, Cavani for me makes more sense tactically. Uh, it was interesting today. The LA Galaxy – I don't know if you picked this up, Kevin. Uh, the LA Galaxy, whenever they put out the Pavone – uh, announcement that basically they had extended the loan that he'd be a designated player listed him as a forward which really when you think about the formation that he played in this last year with the LA Galaxy he's more of a midfielder but if you were going to switch formations to a 4-3-3 which is something you and I both contend Guillermo Barrascoleto wants to do then he would technically be listed as a forward under that formation so I don't know if that was a little hat tip to what is coming but you are looking for you know a really a three forward system if you're going to the 4-3 three which means that somebody like Cavani who's able to go forward and actually track back and play defense is probably more valuable than maybe a Luis Suarez or or maybe a um you know a, a Chicharito Hernandez uh, coming into this 
it's coming into the side. I just don't, the, the system fit isn't perfect for maybe Suarez, although I think Suarez can possibly play defense in Major League Soccer. It, it shouldn't be. Well, all, but, those, all three of those guys you mentioned, they play 4 3 threes with their club now. Yep. Yeah, I, so, I mean, it makes sense. It is it is within the realm of possibility. If you're looking for perfect fit, I lean more towards Cavani right now. That means nothing, by the way. I don't, he, I, I think the Cavani deal is something that the LA Galaxy would do if everything sort of falls into their laps. Um, I don't think they're going to go out of the way to sign a guy for, you know, $20 million um, and have a 25, by the way, like I said, uh, 15, uh, he's asking for $15 million a year and a $25 million transfer PSG is looking for, according to reports today. And both of those numbers are out in Astro land as far as I'm concerned. And then it just makes the, the rumor want to disappear. But I also don't believe those those numbers um, 100%. So wait to see how things sort of pan out and play out. So it'll be interesting to see, again, to where the LA Galaxy are going. But the first thing is this expansion draft on Tuesday. Uh, and then you get into all of the other crazy, stupid, like, M- MLS waiver drafts, and let's see, what other well, ones? Yeah. Before oh. you get too far away, I, I, I want to make one more point on Chicharito because I'm going to just you know, hammer this. I'm going to beat this dead horse. Is, is, this like Dom, dead. is this like Dom Dwyer getting traded? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. It's never going to happen. No, here's another thing that I think fits the Chicharito piece for me is that Dennis DeCloso was at, at Guadalajara when Chicharito came up. He was, he's been with him and around him his whole career with the Mexican national team, with the youth Mexican national teams. Um, you know, he's been a guy that's been in Chicharito's life and, and Chicharito's father's life, um, you know, for most of their soccer careers. So th- I think the one thing that's always been missing is, is Chicharito didn't know when it was time to leave Europe. Um, I think if someone can sort of talk him off that ledge and, and, and make the, the move gentle, I think it would be Dennis DeCloso. Now, whether that happens or not, I think that it's a real long shot. I just think that the situation now is better than it's been for Chicharito in a long time. And I, I just it, it makes too much sense for me that he he has to wind up in MLS at some point before he, he retires. He doesn't have to. I mean, there's no rule. I get where you're coming no, from. I, I know the what you're... marketing alone is is just um, uh, you know he needs to. He's a big deal in Mexico. He's everywhere in Mexico, and he has all kinds of exclusive advertising agreements and sponsorships and stuff. You don't see him much in 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 the U.S. And you know, at the 2014 World Cup, his jersey was the best selling jersey in in Southern California. Uh, better than Messi, better than Suarez, better than anybody. Um, you know, he still is super popular here. And again, the fact that he's bilingual, um, you know, Vela could be that guy. Vela could be doing a lot of that stuff. He just is not interested in it. And yeah. by the way, but you mentioned Jonah. I want to say, I want to throw some props out to Jonah. Um, he did his last press conference in English, um, took the questions in English, some of the answers in English. Um, this is something that I don't think he's self-taught. I'm sure that I mean, he speaks really well and understands really well. So I'm sure he's had some help along the way. But this is a guy that really applied himself to deciding that he's going to be in Southern California. Now, a lot of players on the team speak only Spanish. Guillermo clearly is 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 much more comfortable in Spanish. A lot of the reporters speak Spanish. It's not necessary for Jonah to do that. He wanted to do it. And I've talked to some people inside the team that say that he is just a completely different guy since his brother left. He felt like he always had to defer to his brother who didn't want to learn English, who really didn't want to be that team leader, who didn't want to play for the crest. Since he's left, um, Jonah, according to this person who is part of the team, uh, um, you know, inside the locker room, not a player, but a staff member inside the locker room said, Jonah's just a completely different guy. And I think the fact that he has stepped forward and decided to learn English so he can speak to the media and do sponsorship events for the Galaxy in English Um, props to him. I think he's really decided that he wants to be part of this organization going forward. One one of my favorite players to cover right now. Um, Always, always relatively in a good mood. Um, You know, he's, he's, he's the real deal. I think that if, if the LA gal, listen, he's the next captain. Uh, Whenever this all starts going around, it's Jonathan Dos Santos who's going to wear the armband. He was a little bit of a vice captain last year. Uh, Whenever Zlatan wasn't playing, he would get the armband, that type of thing. But he is the captain of this team. And I think that's good because his work rate and what he was able to do in 2019 really needs to help sustain this team that now has so many roster holes, Kevin. Um, whenever you look at guys, like we said, who aren't coming back and you already know they're sort of gone. I mean, we even have to go to Diego Polenta, and I know Larry and I talked about this on Thursday. Um, but you look at Diego Polenta, and that's sort of a question mark about whether or not he's going to come back. I think the Galaxy want him back, um, but I don't know if Diego Polenta wants to come back. So I, I disagree a little bit. Dennis talked on exit interview day. Dennis was not high on Polenta, and it may be one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. I'm going to talk the guy down because he's going anyways. Right. And I, 
you know, or, but he didn't seem like that Polenta was a guy that he, he w- it seemed like he was hinting at the fact Polenta may not be back. There's a lot of stuff whenever you go back and watch those exit interviews with uh, with Dennis that I think he's hinted in the, I mean, we he, we think he hinted at Zlatan leaving, um, although that didn't seem like that was a very calculated rollout whenever that all came out. Um, that was a, that was a little bit, it seemed like Zlatan put out a, a statement and then, you know, everybody else sort of reacted. I don't know that it was necessarily timed up with everybody else when that happened. Um, so Zlatan leaves, um, you know, that goes away. Dennis hinted at that. I, I think Dennis hinted at Uriel and Tuna and basically said, you know, that, that there was a good chance that Tuna wouldn't be back. So he hinted at that. Fabio Alvarez, he hinted during the exit interviews. And now we know it seems that the loan will not be extended and Fabio Alvarez will not be back. Um, with the LA Galaxy. So, I mean, he's hinted at a lot of things, and he's told, you know, if you pay attention and you can, you know, sort of read between the lines, and sometimes he just flat out tells you, but if you do that, you can sort of figure out who he was high on and who he wasn't. So, you know, they talked a lot about Roman Alessandrini to bring it back to that, and so he seems like he's an important part for the LA Galaxy, and they want him back, but it's going to be about price. And so, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of rebuild in this roster, Kevin, and I didn't think that was going to be the case. I thought there would be a core, and when you look at this core, there's not much of a core anymore. Yeah, there was a, in talking about some players, Dennis actually started the bus up and asked them to lay down in front of it. I mean, it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of easy to follow, but, um, it, People talking about this team being better without Zlatan, and I get where they're coming from. Zlatan was not a good teammate. He clearly had lost support in, in the locker room. I think he lost support in the front office. I think it was an easy – it's probably the easiest um, uh, release of a 30-goal scorer in, in professional soccer history. Um, but he leaves a lot of holes. First of all, where do you get those 30 goals from? I don't know that you get those back. You're going to have to be better on defense to make up for that. I think that – collectively, do you make your goal differential better – Without a lot, maybe that's how you make up. For it. But you're right. The core right now, we don't know who's going to come. If it's Co- if Cavani brings Messi and Suarez, and that's your front three and a four three three, maybe they win a lot of games. But right. with what I see as the core now, and with the and what financially they probably have the possibility of doing, I think Pavone's going to have a great season. But I don't know that Galaxy wins 16 games again. Well, well, I mean, okay. So go on down this list and tell me there is one striker on this list that I can find uh, of any Galaxy player without Zlatan Ibrahimovic on it. We talked about this even last year um, that the Galaxy had no backup to Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Well, there, you know, it's Ethan Zubak is the other is the only other uh, player right now that's listed sort of as a forward or a striker that can play the number nine. Um, in that center striker role. I'm sure you can move some people around and do some things. Maybe Pavone can play up top in that central position. I don't think that's his strong suit, by the way. Um, but the LA Galaxy have to find that. Not only do they have to find a starter, but they probably have to find a backup. Um, and how are they going to rotate through that? So that's really Dennis trying to figure that out. So, I mean, again, just starting lineup. You could say Jonathan Dos Santos starts. Uh, Roman Alessandrini could start if he comes back on the right-hand side. You could start Christian Pavone on the left-hand side. There's no striker. Uh, the back line right now consists of Pipo Gonzalez and Dan Steres with the possibility of Diego Polenta coming back and Rolf Felcher. So there's something there. I don't know if it's any better than last year, however, because that was pretty standard last year. Um, so you have to bring in somebody there who's clearly going to be a starter, and that happens with with Jorgen Shelvick going away. Uh, Joe Corona can start in the midfield for you. Perry Kitchen seems like he's on the way out, but we don't know that for sure. So he could come back and be a bench piece or a starting piece for you. Uh, Antuna is gone. Bingham is in goal with you. Sebastian Legette's probably got to start in there, and he probably takes well, he, over. He's not signed. Sebastian and Legette is out of contract. He's out of contract. So is Steris. Steris is out of contract and not signed yet. Um, so, I mean, these are all the questions. It's not hard to suddenly come down through this list and be like, okay, so who's going to be on the team next year? And, you know, how are they going to do it? As much of a rebuild, Kevin, as they sort of had to do last year and had to, and were stuck with some pieces they didn't like, they now have pieces that they ordered, but a lot of holes to fill. Yeah. And, and I, Dennis is a smart guy. I'm not going to do you know, he has earned our uh, the, the benefit of the doubt. I don't think he lets Antuna and Fabio go unless he has an idea of where he's going to go to replace them. So I'm going to allow, uh, going to give him the benefit of the doubt, but that's a lot to replace because you're not replacing, if you were replacing Fabio and, and, and Antuna, yeah, you could probably do that. But you're also replacing Zlatan in the middle of that. And for all that he, uh, for all the, 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 the suspensions and all the bad stuff off the field and the histrionics on the field, he scored 30 goals, and you got to find someone that's going to replace that. 
Like, yeah, yeah, and, and like you said, you have to do it somehow in some combination of something, or you find a guy who's going to score you 35 goals. I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm sure those guys grow on trees all over the place. Um, I don't know. I just I think this is it. this is the other sort of thing, and I, I think it's it's worth noting. And you said, you know, Dennis deserves the benefit of the doubt. I agree. I think he's really smart. I think he can hit on a bunch of these. Um, but they didn't hit on a bunch last year. Um Christian Pavone was the one real hit there, Kevin, that you can sort of point to and say Dennis nailed that one, and they got that one 100% right. But Diego Polenta, somewhat of a mixed bag. Pipo Gonzalez, mixed bag. Fabio Alvarez was a mixed bag. Um, you know, you can look at uh, Aurelio Antuna was one of the better players, but at the same time, I think he's very tactically immature. He just has a lot of speed right now. He's basically um, Ima Boateng on the right-hand side with a with a much better finishing skill. Uh, I'll give him that. Uh, I do not place a whole bunch of... Uh, uh, I don't know, weight on his international career. Whenever you look at the goals that were scored against and how that goes, I mean... Yeah, three against Cuba. I mean, yeah, it just, I, you look at, it, yes, he improved, and yes, he made a name for himself, but does that mean anything? And how successful was he with the LA Galaxy? He was a borderline, you know, five, six, seven out of ten, whenever you look at it. So, I mean, that was one of the better hits that, that Dennis got. So, if we go back and we grade the guys who were brought in, you know, Pavone is the clear standout, but quite honestly, you know, you and I could have made the call on Pavone. That That's a guy who is, you know, looks destined for bigger things than Major League Soccer. So, I don't think that one's a hard one. But the other ones, uh, I expected Diego Polenta to be better. I expected people yeah. to go, Gonzalez to be people much Gonzalez better. Gonzalez and Diego Polenta, I mean, with the billing they got, when they came in, it was like, these guys are the greatest soccer players since Paley retired. And the, I just, uh, first of all, I didn't see a ton of desire and I didn't see a ton of skill. And in, in a, at times it almost looked like they were saying, this league is beneath me. I don't really have to try. It, it, I, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm incorrect on that, but that's just kind of the feeling I got. Yeah. I mean, with Polenta, I'll, I'll say it, there were some flashes of real brilliance, but most of that came going forward. I think his best game was probably in, uh, in the first El Trafico of this year. I think whenever he, he basically uh, was put and marked on, uh, on Carlos Vela and had a great game. Um, and did a really good job on that. So, um, yeah, you look at all those things, and I think that, you know, the Galaxy um, missed more than they hit, and Dennis missed more than he hit, but I still have some faith. We, we talk about his smarts and his plan and Guillermo's plan and what they're trying to do. I feel like they have a plan, but implementing that is going to be difficult, and if it, if it doesn't get implemented right, and we talked about, you know, taking steps backwards in 2020, I think it's very possible the Gala Galaxy take a step backwards in 2020. And if that's I the do too. And if that's the case, Kevin, somebody loses their job. I, I don't think it's one of those. I don't think it's Guillermo or Dennis, but I think they've been kind of open on the idea that this could be a two- to three-year job, and they're only through year one, and they're going to argue that really year one starts now because – Guillermo inherited pieces and didn't get to build the team he wanted. I think that's going to be their argument, whether it wins the day or not. I think their argument is going to be, look, we knew it. We told you it was a two- to three-year project. This is actually year one. Forget last year. That's year minus one. Uh, <laughs> and and we we need time to do this. And in a sense, by by doing that, they're hurting themselves in that they're, they've given themselves this extended deadline. I mean, with most sports teams, it's like we need to win this year. That's, and that's MLS. Have, and, and, that, and they're t they're they're saying we got to we're not expected to be good this year. Wait till 2022, boy. That's our year. Yeah, and, and that's you can't do that. No, no, you can't do that. And, and Bruce, you know, we used to ask Bruce whenever he was around and and talk to him, and we're like, well, it seems like you're building this team to win now. He and his response usually was, this is Major League Soccer. The league is designed to for you to win now. You have to win now because you can't keep a team together. It's very difficult to keep a team together. So you expect this this turnover of talent. And so you have to construct it to win now. So it's up to Dennis and it's up to Guillermo to win now. There are not projects where you win in two or three years in Major League Soccer. The salary structure does not allow it. So figure out a way to put together the pieces that win now. And, well, and that's here, that's here, tough. Here's the other two things. And you and I have talked a lot on off the air about this. And, of course, I'm right and you're wrong. But um, the there's a 500-pound or 800-pound gorilla up the freeway in LAFC. And so – in a perfect world, you know, if the Galaxy needed a year or two to kind of put things together, that would probably be okay. But, I mean, let's be realistic. LAFC had the best season in, in MLS regular season history. Yes, they lost in the playoffs. They had the guy that set the goal record in Vela. They play a very attractive brand of football at a brand new stadium. The Galaxy have to – that's what the Galaxy are competing with. Um, it, everywhere, on the field, off the field, for hearts and minds, for season ticket holders, for sponsorships, for TV time. They're competing with a team 11 miles away 
for all of those things. And the Galaxy, if they're in rebuild mode while LAFC is setting records, that's not going to work. And the other part of that is the idea that you need to have a big star in L.A. We have Clayton Kershaw. We have LeBron James. We have Mike Trout. You don't win in L.A. with, with you know, uh, uh, role players. And I talked to um, – Garth Langerway at Seattle, but right before the MLS Cup, and he talked about. He said our fans in Seattle are soccer fans. They want to see good soccer, they want to see uh, soccer players, and they're less interested in star power. And that works in Seattle. There's no other soccer team. There's no Carlos Vela 11 miles up the freeway. Um, they don't have to compete with LeBron James. So that that works in Seattle. It doesn't work here, where there are you know there are what's two professional hockey teams, two professional baseball teams, two. NFL teams, two major college programs. We have uh, the the Sparks and the WNBA. There's a lot going on here, and, and to compete for fans' interest in dollars, you need to have someone to come out and see. And that's why I think you see the Galaxy talking to Cavani and Suarez and maybe a Chicharito. That's the kind of player they have to bring in. So you can talk about this rebuild all you want, and you can set set up and have a nice four three three, and you can play attractive football. But if the guy putting the ball in the net is not somebody fans have heard of. They're probably going to go up the freeway and watch Carlos Vela, and I think the Galaxy know that. Yeah, I mean, but I'm glad you finally came around to the whole that the, there's other places. Well, I tried outside. to talk you into this. You kept saying that, no, they can win with role players, and I kept That's, telling you they can't. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you finally came over to my dark side, where <laughs> where I have been preaching the two— By the way, I, I, every time I say it, I get more people will be like, no, that's not how it works. If a star player comes in and they lose, then there won't be seats filled. Uh, yeah, duh. That's what I said. Two things. Two things in the framework for Josh's, you know, easy formula here. Uh, star power and winning. Star power and winning. But, but, but here's, yes, and you're right. But here's where here's where it flips because I was on that other side. I, I was a Garth Langaway fan. So if, if, if you win games with Raul Rudy Diaz, who we can't even say his name, much less know where, uh, about him. From that's, Peru. Just, that's just you, by the way. I can say his name just fine. I can also say Garth uh, you, Lagerway, which is what his name is. But other than you can the, also say, who? oh, yeah, who's the coach in, in Columbus again? The, oh, Caleb. <laughs> Caleb Porter, right? That's how you call them? Caleb. Caleb Porter. Caleb, yeah. Yes. Mr. Porter. So I, I, I came around to this because when I'm thinking of that, I'm thinking of, okay, let's bring in Steven Gerrard and watch him limp around and be totally ineffective and watch the team lose in the playoffs. Um, and I thought, we don't need any more Steven Gerrards. But then Zlatan showed up and scored 30 mm-hmm. goals. And I thought, aha, this is what you need. You need a guy, an older guy it, with a name, if if he's older. There's nothing wrong with bringing in a 25 or 26 or 27-year-old nope. uh, you know, who could score too. But uh, those players are not going to come here if they're, you know, if they're, if they're big World Cup stars or whatever. Christian Pavone came because he's a little bit of damaged goods. But, uh, you know, if you bring in a big star who can play like Zlatan, then it works. If you bring in Steven Gerrard, it doesn't work. So I, I'm on board with that. It, it, all things being equal, you rather have a, a Chicharito Hernandez than a Pitti Martinez if you're in L.A., uh, and that works. But finding that guy is going to be oh. difficult. But I guess my point is when the Galaxy are rebuilding, they need to think about success on the field and success at the box office. And yeah. sometimes that's a difficult uh, nut to crack. I, I keep saying it, and people I don't think people get it, but like, okay, so let's let's pretend for a second, Kevin, that there are 12,500 season ticket holders for the LA Galaxy, which I think is a generous there gift. There are to not. There yeah, are more like 9,000. Okay, so let's give them 12,500. It makes my math easy. You have to find 12,500 walk-ups or 12,500 people who are interested in the game that week or the week before or however it is in order to sell out Dignity Health Sports Park. There's basically 25,000, 25,500 seats right now, even though it used to be 27,000. Let's not get into Thank that. Thank you, argument. Chargers. Yeah, um, so twenty five thousand five hundred is is what you, what you have. So you have to sell that. That's walk up tickets that the Galaxy have to sell. Now you could you could blame their season ticket policy if you want. Sure, okay, but that doesn't solve the problem. Is that people will show up when there's something to watch. Um, when the new when New York Red Bulls came with Thierry Henry um, and they played Dave, they played the LA Galaxy with Landon Donovan and Robbie Keane and uh, David Beckham. Uh, and by the way, New York had Luke Rogers on that team as well. But when they came. The stadium was electric, totally filled to the brim, absolutely crazy. That's how it was. That's how it is. You get the star power, you get the winning, you get an attractive game, an attractive matchup. That's what it means. Um, and last year it was as much. I think you're going to disagree with me because you're nuts, but it was as much a lot of time against Fella as it was LAFC against Galaxy. I mean, there. Were- 
Well, it, yes, it was a, 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 a Derby game. I get it. But, I mean, people wanted to see those two guys go against each other, and they both scored eight goals in the series, I mean, which showed how important they thought it was. Yeah, it, it is, and it, it's important for, for all of those things. So, no, I, I agree with you that it was as much Zlatan and Vela. I well, mean, that's thank what, you for coming over to my side. That's what, that's what made, you know, that's what made those El Traficos what they were. It also was the fact that the two fan bases generally dislike each other, uh, which I can't wait uh, once again until they move that game, uh, both of those games that get played every year. Or maybe it's going to go back to three whenever they go to Western Conference and Central Conference and the Eastern Conference because there's so many teams. But however they do, they move them to Inglewood and, you know, they divide that big stadium in half and there's 60,000 people there watching that game. Um, and they even put in a grass field for it because that's how big MLS is. What do you think? I don't know. I was, I was trying. Not, not happening. Not, happen. not uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, expansion draft coming up. Maybe on... in your baby's lifetime. Well, of course. He's got a, you know, he's a, a future podcaster, as Larry Morgan calls him. I tried to see if there was a, a onesie that said future podcaster, and I'll probably just have to make one. That's that's. Did you guys really decide Zlatan Jr. is the name? Zlatan, Zlatan David Landon Jr. Yeah. Uh-huh. Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> Bruce. Bruce. That's, that's, that's his name for Yovan sure. Yovan Karowski got left off. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> Uh, I don't think Yovan's naming any of his kids after me either, so I don't I don't think uh, that's happening either way. All right, so that's what the uh, that's what the LA Galaxy have coming up. Expansion draft coming up on Tuesday. Um, there's other drafts and other things going on, but the Galaxy at least get Christian Pavone back for 2020, which we all expected. Uh, he's a designated player now. We've explained that to you. We explained why now there will be more focus on Ramon Alessandrini. You have that. You know who the protected and unprotected list is for the expansion draft. And what do you know? Another 55 minute podcast. Um, so we once again uh, were able to pull it all together and talk for way longer probably than we should have. Uh, anything else you want to get to? No, you got baby duties I, to go to. I got stuff to put together and, you know, things to wash and all sorts of stuff. So countdown. I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. Countdown is uh, is now officially on. We are, uh, we are basically one month away. So uh, Ooh, 30 so days. 30 days and counting. Yeah, the De- December 19th is when it is. And I think Ashley Cole's birthday is on December 19th. So, you know, if, he, if he's born on December 19th, we'll probably just have to name him Ashley Cole. Ashley, Guessman. that would be great. That would be a good one. Uh, all right. I think that about does it. If you're looking for Kevin on Twitter, find him at kbaxter11 and then head on over to LATimes.com for all of his writing. You can find it at right there. LATimes.com, soccer writing, covering Southern California, U.S. men's national team, U.S. women's national team. Uh, all that fun stuff is right there for you. So LATimes.com. If you're looking for me on Twitter at Jay Guessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and of course at Galaxy Podcast. And of course, head on over to cornerthegalaxy.com. The off-season tracker is right there for you, ready to fill you in on all the moves, all the drafts, everything that's going on with the LA Galaxy in this off-season, including those rumors as well. All right, that does it for Mr. Kevin Baxter. I'm Josh Guessman. You've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy from the Box podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Arajo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, 